So, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Ryan Platty. I am a professor of Greek at Northwestern and the director of the Ancient Greek program here. So, I not only teach classes, but I organize well, the whole program whereby people study Ancient Greek here. Awesome. Uh, and we wanted to just introduce ourselves. Uh, we are uh, members of the CTD Backpack, a uh, program within the Center for Talent Development at Northwestern. Uh, and we have a monthly conference. Um, so the first question that we always ask uh, people is really, we want to learn about your pathway. Uh, these are students that uh, have a, an immense passion for what they do. Uh, and we want to know how, how passionate you were as a student, and as, uh, as you went through kind of your pathway, and what really motivated you. Yeah, sure. So I always been really interested in poetry, uh, even when I was a little kid. And it was mainly English poetry. Uh, I liked the language itself. I liked how beautiful it was, but I also was sort of attracted to the rules and the structure of poetry. It was art with boundaries that I really enjoyed. And when I was in high school, I decided to learn Latin, essentially because I wanted to be able to read the texts that English poets were referring to so I could understand English poetry better. And then when I got on to college, I decided to add Greek really for the exact same reason. So I could just read English literature better, but I just loved Latin and Greek language so much that I ended up deciding to focus on that in graduate school because I could still study literature like I wanted to in English, but it would be with the languages that I liked so much. And when you're studying ancient Greek poetry and ancient Greek drama, it's all about mythology. So mythology ends up not necessarily being the particular focus of your research, but it's in a way the language that the things that you're reading are speaking through. And that's how I ended up doing what I do. Awesome. How, how young did you, did you know that you, you wanted to do this? Like, were, were you a very young student when you got inspired? Uh, sort of. Uh, I mean, when I was a, when I was really young, I knew that I wanted to go on to graduate school. Uh, at the time, I thought I'd go into sciences or something. Uh, but I think when I was in high school, I decided I wanted to do a PhD in literature. And it wasn't until I was in college and really knee deep in classical literature that I decided I really wanted it to be in classics. But yeah, I'd, I'd known for a pretty long time that I was passionate about it and wanted to know a lot. And, and what, what most excites you now, uh, you know, as, as an instructor now, what still excites you about, about your field? So in terms of teaching, the thing that I like is students all come to college knowing a little bit about Greek mythology and about the ancient world and ancient literature because it's just sort of all around us. But I like being able to open that up and show students uh, a little bit more about the things that they've learned, that showing them how to read the texts in the original languages, learning to understand how the texts functioned in antiquity. I like mm -hmm. seeing them sort of find new meanings in things that they've known for a really long time. So that's what's exciting for me in terms of teaching. In terms of my research and the things that I like studying, there's a sort of funny misconception about classical literature. People think that because people have been reading it for a really long time, we must know everything about it. But the yeah. truth is that ancient literature wasn't studied in a modern way until pretty recently. Uh, it hasn't been studied in a really scientific way any longer than anything else uh, has been. Uh, we didn't even have archaeology until about 100 years ago. We didn't have linguistics as a science until about 100 years ago. And with those sorts of tools, we can understand ancient literature in ways that nobody has ever been able to understand them until right now. Uh, so we understand them in a way that is really different, even from people 200 years ago who were steeped in this stuff, who read it all the time. We just understand the ancient world much, much better. So we can say and see much more clearly. And that's the sort of thing that excites me now. That's awesome. Um, and we're going to open it up for a stu few students' questions. So we're going to bring them on uh, one Great. by one. Uh, feel free if, if you don't know the answer or if, if it's just something that, you know, you maybe not feel comfortable answering, feel free to and we'll go on. Uh, Saeed, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you on to ask uh, your question. Um, Saeed, are you there? Yeah. Go ahead, Saeed. Uh, what is a titan, and are they more powerful and better than gods? 
they aren't more powerful. They're the they're they're gods, uh, just the way that the other gods are. They're the first generation of gods. They're the generation that came around before Zeus. And when Zeus was born, he and the gods of his generation fought against the Titans and defeated them and ended up locking them in Tartarus, which is some deep underground world. It's meant to be as far beneath us as Olympus is above us. And he just imprisoned them there forever. Uh, so I suppose Zeus beat them. So you have to say that Zeus was better, but they were really big and really scary and were very hard to defeat. In fact, they almost beat the Olympians. Uh, the story goes that the Titans were going to win and then the god Pan scared them all. Our word panic actually comes from the god Pan and from wow. this story that he terrified the Titans and they were so scared that Zeus was able to jump in at the last second and beat them. So they're, they are actually gods themselves. They're just older gods who lost. Awesome. Uh, Andy, I'm going to bring you on. I don't know if your, your mic is working. Andy, are you there? Yeah, one, he has a great name that I share. Uh, Andy, are you there? I'll ask Andy's uh, question for him. He okay. said, did the belief in gods continue past the scientific revolutions uh, and such? Uh, yeah, uh, I, mean, I suppose there's probably lots of different scientific revolutions you might be thinking about. Uh, but what we think of as modern science, at least as a way of thinking about the world, begins really early, uh, probably begins in say, the Hellenistic period. This is the period after Alexander the Great takes over Greece. So this would be, say, the third century BC. People didn't have access to technology that we have now, but they did create a system of studying the world that asked people to temporarily, at least, uh, remove the gods. They said, don't necessarily believe the gods don't exist, but try your best to figure out the world without resorting to them and see how far you can get. That way of thinking about the world was really going by the third century BC, but People continued, other people continued believing in gods. Uh, there's no, in the ancient world, you don't really seem to have to choose between science and religion. A really good place to see that is in ancient medicine, because ancient medicine is a real science, and they were studying it to the very best of their ability, like scientists. Their abilities are limited, but they really were studying it and learning an awful lot. But people could go to a doctor one day and go to a magician the next day and go to a temple of a god and ask for cleansing the next day. There, you don't really have to choose in the ancient world. They end up sort of coexisting. Great. Um, Angelica, I'm going to add a question or a follow-up on uh, Pan. Uh, yeah, sure. So I'm going to bring Angelica. Angelica, you there? Why was Pan so scary? Why is he so scary? You know what's funny is we don't really know. The One of the really fascinating things about this literature is that we don't have all of it. All we have is the stuff that survived for two or 3,000 years, which is a tiny, tiny little bit of what there was in antiquity. So we know that he scared them, but we don't actually know how he did it, which is weird. You'd think that if something that big is something that we'd have recorded, but it just isn't. And sometimes there are really, really big questions that we can't answer just because we've lost so much literature. Um, Sola has a question about the gods. Um, sure. Sola, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Go ahead, Sola. What was the oldest Greek myth that we know of? The oldest Greek myth? That's a hard question to answer. The so I can say the oldest Greek uh, literature that we have, the oldest sources we have, that's Homer. So the Iliad and the Odyssey, the story of the war at Troy, and the story of Odysseus, one hero at Troy, and his really long, really difficult journey homeward. That's the earliest story that we get. But that comes in the 8th century, because that's when writing was invented. That's when the alphabet was invented. Exactly what 
they believe before that is hard to know. So there are, I'm sure, older stories, or there were older stories that we've just lost. But the oldest texts that we have, the oldest myths that we have, are the ones from Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Great. Um, I don't know who posted this. This says guest one, but I'm going to ask for you. And it, it's more to you. Uh, is um, How hard was it to, to kind of translate from have, have, did you have to translate from English to Greek and, and did you have to learn like a, a whole new language within that? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you learn the so ancient Greek is really different from modern Greek. It's they're you know, they're 2000 years apart and languages always change. Uh, 2000 years from now, English will sound really different than it does right now. So I had to learn ancient Greek and I had to learn Latin and those wow. took a lot of time. So I started studying Latin in high school and then added Greek when I was in college. The good thing about studying ancient languages is that you don't actually learn to speak them because nobody speaks them anymore. Ancient Greek is so different from modern Greek, nobody speaks it. The same thing with Latin. Nobody speaks Latin anymore. So when you study them, you know, when you study a modern language, you spend years just learning to hear the sounds and make the sounds. When you study an ancient language, you don't have to do that. You can learn the grammar and the vocabulary pretty fast, and then you can just jump right into reading. So wow. in the classes that I teach now, students study ancient Greek grammar and vocabulary for one year, and then in the second year, we just start reading ancient Greek literature. Great. Uh, Kristen, are you there? Is your mic on? Uh, I know you had a question. I don't know if her mic is on or not. I'll, I'll ask her a uh, okay. question if she's unable to come on. Um, she said, did Greeks worship or praise their gods? And if so, how or where did they do this? How did they worship their gods? Yeah, yeah so they worshiped them constantly. And they did it at uh, all you really needed to worship a god was an icon. That's a little image of a god. It could be really small, it could be really big, but you needed an image of the god, and you needed an altar. And the altar was really different from what we mean when we say altar now. The mm -hmm. altar was used for sacrifices. You would oh, wow. sacrifice an animal to the god. And that was really all you needed. And those would be all over the place, just thousands and thousands of them. And if you had an icon, an image of the god that was really fancy, you might build a temple to house it in. So you could go to big temples, and some of them were enormous, and do really fancy worship there. Or you could do really small-scale rural worship. All you needed was a little icon and an altar. But you could also offer prayers to them really whenever. Uh, there's plenty of examples in, say, the Iliad of people fighting, and then in the middle of the battle just stopping and asking the god for help with a prayer. The interesting thing is that the prayers are usually reciprocal. They ask the gods to help them because they've worshipped the gods before. They say things like, I've offered you lots of sacrifices before. Now it's time for you to help me. Yeah, wonderful. I, I guess I have a, a kind of a, a personal question we ask a lot is, um, it, what was the hardest or most challenging time that you've had and how did you kind of overcome it? You know, they're, they're going to be going into some of the, these challenging times. Do you have any advice for them in that? Yeah. So I think probably the most challenging time would have been in graduate school when okay. I had lots and lots and lots of exams coming at me. And they were really, really big, giant exams. And the things that I learned from that or I guess a couple things. Uh, one, this is sort of a funny thing to say, but don't have pride about your studying. That is, don't assume that you don't need to study something. Don't assume that you're beyond studying the basics. Even when I was studying for my PhD exams, I would the first step would be going back to the most basic information and making sure that I had it down. Because even though by that point I'd been studying for 10 years, there was still stuff like basic information that I had forgotten or maybe misunderstood in the first place mm -hmm. that I actually had to go all the way back to basics and fix. And the other thing is to not be discouraged when you fail. Uh, in my own PhD exams, they allow you to, they allowed you to fail and then take it again. And I failed my 
first Latin PhD exam. And oh. I was very surprised by that because I'd been studying Latin for so long. And then I had to go back. I had to study it again for like another year and then take the exam again. And I passed that time and passed really well. But it would have been easy to be discouraged at that point. But people fail. It's completely normal. Everybody fails. People don't usually talk about it. You sort of pretend that it didn't happen. But in reality, everybody fails big things. The important thing is learning how to regroup and restudy and take it on again. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's a really uh, kind of key example is that that failing is okay sometimes as long as you use that and, and that you, you learn from it and you're, you're motivated after that. And I think that's yeah. really and it, it's not even just okay; it's expected. Absolutely, I think everybody fails, and we sort of live in a world where you're not supposed to admit that you failed. Uh, you know, my my wife is a lawyer, and when you're a lawyer, you have to take the bar exam big important exam and tons of people fail it the first time or the first two times they take it and nobody ever admits later that they failed and that makes it really hard when you fail because you feel like you don't know anybody who's failed before but in actuality you probably know lots of people who did and they just don't tell you who were the first guys who uh, i didn't put their name here but guest are you there your audio on audio is on but uh so I, I can say who the first gods were if right. that's what so yeah. in in greek the greek story of creation it sort of varies uh there's greek religion is not quite like religions that we think of now where there's a text you know like christians will go to the bible and that mm -hmm. has a real sort of truth value in the ancient world there's no single text so as you start poking around you find some people believed one thing, some people believe something a little bit different, but the most common version of creation holds that there was chaos. And chaos is actually a Greek word just meaning sort of a gaping yawn. There's sort of a big gaping emptiness. And out of chaos came the very first generations of gods. Uh, those are things like Gaia, meaning earth, and Uranos, meaning heaven. And then from Gaia and Uranos essentially came all the others. But the very first, maybe not God, but the first thing was chaos. Mm. And it's funny, in some sources, there's just chaos. And in one of our very earliest texts, there's chaos and there's eros. Eros means love. And you would think that, but in other texts, eros is a really late god. But in some, he's really early. It's a really different world where you can have disagreements quite that big. Great. I think we, we have time for two more questions, and we're going to take one from Pravnash and uh, Kristen. So, Pravnash, you want to come on first um, in one second to turn on your mic? Pravnash, are you there? Hi. Um, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, yep. I can hear you. Yep. Um, hello. Um, are all gods like brother and sisters? Uh, not all of them, but an awful, awful lot of them are, yeah. So the what usually happened was one or two Earth gods would produce lots of other gods. So you end up with a whole lot of brothers and sisters floating around. Yeah, but not every single one. And Kristen, are you there for your question? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um... So would you consider Greek mythology a form of religion? Uh, not quite. I would say that the mythology is the stories that are an integral part of ancient religion. But ancient religion is much more than just the stories. Uh, ancient religion is the rituals involved in the religion as well. And the religion and the rituals are really complicated. There's not just basic sacrifices, but huge, enormous rituals uh, that differ from place to place and time to time. Religion is more than just the stories people tell. They're a whole, it's a whole system of beliefs and actions. So I would say that myths are an integral part of ancient religion, but it's not the exact same thing as ancient religion. Wonderful. Well, uh, Dr. Platy, we really uh, appreciate you coming on and answering our questions. Uh, I'm happy to.
So, so thank you very much. And and um, if we have any follow-up questions, do you mind if we just uh, send them? Yeah. If you have any questions about myth, about ancient ancient world, ancient languages, just let me know. Well, this was uh, wonderful. So thank you again for coming on. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you. I was really happy to do it. Everybody have a nice night.